What distinguishes energy from most other technologies is the sheer imposing scale of energy demand. Right now we use energy at an average rate of 14 trillion watts. That rate is going to double almost all projections say within our lifetimes to something like 25 trillion watts. Even if we save as much energy as all the energy we use now combined, you still have to make as much clean energy as all the oil, coal, gas, and nuclear power on our planet combined within our lifetimes if we're really going to think about cutting carbon emissions as carbon dioxide by 80 or 90 percent from their 1990 levels. Energy efficiency is something that we as individuals can absolutely do now. It's not like trying to vote or influence public utilities commissioners to buy wind energy for your municipality. We can as individuals make choices about what mileage cars we buy, about substituting a light car for a heavy car, about weatherization, about insulation, about deep retrofits in buildings and in our homes where all studies show that one could save 70 percent of the energy now consumed in an average home by using best practices on insulation, on dual pane windows, on good attic insulation, on heating, ventilating, and air conditioning systems and things like that. So we should be doing those things because if we don't save energy like our lives depended on it, we make a difficult problem nearly impossible. We can probably save most of this energy with just technological shifts. This is something that many people don't necessarily get their grips around mentally that saving energy doesn't mean taking the bus all the time and giving up my car. It doesn't necessarily mean downsizing my home or getting rid of my swimming pool heater. It does mean being smart about how we use our precious energy resources. It means insulating our homes better so we use less energy. It means more passive solar heating and lighting so we don't have to turn on that furnace or turn on as many light bulbs. It means getting light emitting diode LED lights instead of incandescent lights. Almost all of these things after the initial capital investment actually save people money as well as saving them energy. It's just that we have to get into the mentality of thinking a little bit more in the long term as opposed to the short term, I can't afford that light bulb because it's four dollars and the incandescent one's 50 cents, even though over the life of the bulb, it's smarter to buy the more expensive compact fluorescent or LED bulb than it is to buy the cheaper one up front. So there's no question that coal is where the rubber meets the road in energy policy. First, coal is the cheapest source of electrical power in most regions of the world, especially in places like China, where they put on last year a mind-boggling two gigawatts of coal-fired electric power a week, every week for an entire year. On the other hand, uh, there are things we can do about that. One, in the short term, we could decide to pay a little bit more for our electrical power and then instead take that money and use renewable energy. We could actually first save energy so we don't have to build any new coal-fired power plants to meet demand. We could build more nuclear power plants. We have many options and we just have to get into the mentality that we value our atmosphere, there's a price to be paid for emitting carbon dioxide to it, and when we figure that price in the math, then maybe it's not always the case that coal is the cheapest long-run way to make power. Maybe we value our planet a little bit in the arithmetic too, and if we do that, 
then you come up with a different calculus. Well, we have to ultimately have a price on carbon dioxide emitted to the air. Right now, when carbon dioxide is free to emit, we emit it like it ain't going out of style. There's no penalty to doing that, like there isn't a penalty to taking 10 newspapers out of the newsstand instead of one. So that's what people will economically do. But it's more than that. In addition to pricing carbon dioxide emissions so as to level the playing field, we also have to have policies that level that playing field because there are hundreds of public utility commissions across our country. They all have different agendas, whether or not it's renewable portfolio standards or just pure saving consumers from ratepayer increases in their electric bills or some other combination of making sure if you're in Kentucky to buy homegrown coal-powered electricity instead of renewable energy from another state. So we have to work on how we justify to our public utilities commissions and to our ratepayers that we value our environment as much as we value our utility bills. Yeah. This is true about any energy portfolio. Just like investing in a broad investment portfolio in the stock market when you choose some of this and some of that, it's never the case that there's one magic bullet that's going to all be our solar future or all be our nuclear future. And so you always have to mix and match. That being said, we do need to be careful about the difference between getting a little bit of something in our energy mix and getting a lot of that same thing in our energy mix. If we tried to use 50% of our energy coming from wind, well, naturally the question arises, what do you do when the wind doesn't blow that day? You can have some demand management, but if half of your energy is coming from wind and there's no wind that day, you have a blackout and people don't like to have blackouts. We now have 99.99% mandated reliability on our electricity system. Nobody likes it when the lights go out, especially when they're not expecting it. So to build a full energy system, we need to think about all the tools we have. We need to think about compensating for the intermittency of sun and wind with massive energy storage. We need to think about forecast pricing to make it more expensive to buy electricity on a, on a day when we won't have so much from renewables. We need to think about storage solutions. We need to think about not just advocating for individual pieces. We need to think about what it takes to build a reliable, complete, sustainable energy system that can bring energy to people whenever they want it, wherever they need it. Maybe the prospect of a blackout causing them not to get re-elected scares them more than just the prospect of a blackout, but probably not too much other than that. So this is clearly an issue, and we do have technology gaps there. You will hear that we have all the technology we need. We just need the political will. Well, we actually do have a lot of technology that we can deploy, and political will will go a long way toward helping us get that out there. And it's no excuse to say because we can't do everything, therefore we should do nothing. At the same time, we do need to realize that there are some things that we don't yet really know how to do, and we need to be doing R&D to develop them so we have them when we need them. We need to find ways to make solar panels really cheap to install. For instance, something that people can go paint on their roof or roll out like carpet, so we can deploy them massively. We need to think about ways to store energy, so we can use renewables when the wind doesn't blow and when the sun doesn't shine, and not always have to confine ourselves to just getting them on peak bright sunny days, or find ways to get energy from the Midwest at night to California when we don't actually need it at night. So we should be doing a lot of these installations that we know won't be the whole answer, but at the same time working on those gaps so we can fill in the pieces of the puzzle just in time for us to put it all together. 
So on a grand scale, there are two different criteria. One is short-term costs. And in the short-term costs, the cheapest renewable energy is hydroelectricity. On the other hand, we've done it pretty much everywhere we can do it. Then you have other options like maybe wind, the fastest growing renewable, and it's the next cheapest. And so if you're looking just at short-term costs, you get one picture. On the other hand, if you're looking at the long-term resource and comparing that to how much humans have a thirst for energy, there's only one really, really big card on the table, and that's the sun. More energy from the sun hits the earth in one hour than all the energy consumed on our planet in an entire year. Nothing else comes close. In one year, more energy from the sun hits the earth than all the energy consumed on our planet in human history. And that statement is going to be just as true in a hundred years from today as it is today. This is why I say we can probably piece together an energy system with some wind and some biomass and some geothermal and some tidal and some coal. But there's one big, big card that we have to play and it would be smart to try to play it and that is to get our energy from the biggest source there is for our Earth and that's our sun. I think that personally, ultimately, although we can think about storing electricity in batteries or think about storing it in compressed air, those suffer from energy density, the amount of energy you can actually pack into a given volume. Now we know this is intuitively true because even though you can compress air and store energy, everybody knows you can't go very far in your car by storing the energy in deflating your tires. Everybody knows you can't really go very far on battery energy for powering your house. You can't even light up that little dome light in your car for very long before you drain the battery. Imagine trying to run your big screen TV or your toaster or some other electrical load. You'd need banks and banks of batteries. The reason for this is the energy density in the best battery so far is 200 watt hours in a kilogram of the whole mass of the battery. The energy density in a gallon of gasoline is 13,000 watt hours per kilogram. Chemical fuels and chemical bonds are by far the best way to store energy we know of in the universe other than in the nucleus getting it from the atom. And so I personally believe that we're going to have to find a way to do what nature figured out. We're going to have to be able to store energy in chemical bonds, just like a plant does, storing it in the bonds through photosynthesis. Now plants make fuels that humans can't use. We have to work hard to put an energy and boil it and cook it and process it to make lignocellulose junk into biofuels like ethanol or butanol or something else that we could use. But we do have to find a way to directly take the sun and make a fuel that humans can use like hydrogen or gasoline or diesel fuel or biodiesel equivalent so that we can get energy to wherever people need it whenever they want it. So I personally do research in the area of artificial photosynthesis of trying actually to mimic by inspiration the functions of what a leaf does in photosynthesis which in its essence is taking the energy from sunlight and converting it directly into stored chemical fuel. Now plants don't do this very well. In fact, they stop working at a light intensity only one-tenth of that in the bright sun. And the reason is that plants are meant to be working in a canopy of shade. And if you get too bright sunlight on them, they actually have radical damage from their free radicals and they have to spend a lot of energy to rebuild their photosynthesis machinery every 30 minutes, even under this dim sunlight. And if they get more bright sunlight, they have to spend a lot more energy just to stay alive. So we need to find other components that do what the photosynthetic chlorophylls in plants do, 
but that don't saturate at a tenth of the light intensity of sun, that don't involve trading off land that we need to grow for food instead for fuel, and that don't have the drawbacks of having to have these living systems that we need precious green matter on our planet for other things. We think we can do this. We have pieces that work much better than a plant's pieces do. In the same way that although birds have feathers, airplanes don't, and they still fly pretty fast. So we're taking little pieces of semiconductors on the nano and micro scale and using them instead of the chlorophyll that nature uses to absorb sunlight. They capture that light and then they separate that electricity, but we don't run it through wires. Instead, we hook it up to catalysts that just like a leaf, store that energy not as electricity, but in making the chemical fuels, hydrogen and oxygen, from only sunlight and water. This is a true artificial photosynthesis because we are doing the function of a plant of taking sunlight and cheap chemicals and as the output we're making a fuel that can provide energy to people to use in a convenient form. So right now in this field there are three things that we would all like to have. We would like it to last a long time. We would like it to be very efficient so we don't have to cover very large land areas. And we would like it to be really cheap. And right now we can have two out of those three, but not all three at the same time. The pieces that we have that last a long time and that work really well are too expensive. The pieces that we have that are cheap and that last a long time don't work very well. And this is the issue. So we have a demonstration system that does tell us there is a light at the end of the tunnel. But we have to find ways to replace expensive metals like platinum with cheap metals like iron. We have to find ways to replace expensive pure semiconductors with cheap light absorbers. Now we know nature figured this out because nature doesn't use platinum in algae that make hydrogen, it uses a cheap metal iron. Nature's catalysts aren't poisoned by carbon monoxide and sulfur. They actually use them in the molecule to keep it function. So people like my colleagues in chemistry are fishing these active sites out of bacteria and trying to build models of them as molecules to do just what nature did with the same cheap chemicals that it used as opposed to expensive ones. It's actually not alchemy in the same, it's bio-inspired. Once you knew that a bird could fly, you didn't build an airplane out of feathers. We built it with other materials. And so really what it is, it's like building a, a B-2 bomber in the sense that we have a system that we think could be a, a new design of flight. It's going to be stealthy and it's going to have a different range and it's going to have these wings that are different than normal airplane wings and it's going to fly. But to do it, we have to put all the pieces together. We have to invent some of these pieces. And it's not enough just to invent the engine. You've got to have the wings. You've got to have the new materials. You've got to have the plane in the air. It's got to fly for a certain distance and it better come back in one piece and you've got to be able to make a lot of them, not just one. And so we have these criteria that a successful system isn't just one piece, but is the whole thing flying on its mission and returning safely and being able to make a lot of these energy conversion devices so that anybody can put them up anywhere. So advances in energy technology, I think, is one of the prime areas that is ripe for innovation. The reason we haven't innovated so much in energy technology is because energy was cheap. Oil in the 1980s was $8 a barrel. So nobody cared, so nobody tried. Now we're worried about energy security. We're all worried at one level or another about national security. We're worried about environmental security. These things are not going to go away no matter what the price of oil is. And so we really need to ramp up getting all sorts of smart people, trying all sorts of things, knowing that only one-tenth of them are going to work. But that's exactly what we want to do. We want to let the hundred flowers bloom and then pick the few that have the kernels of the 
right answers that can be scaled and cheap. And this can occur in a variety of areas. It can occur in really cheap solar panels that don't look like anything we know today. We shouldn't have to have people hammer these glass slides up on your roof and make sure they don't crack. We should have solar panels that you can go to the hardware store and buy a bucket of paint and paint on your roof or roll out like carpet. Those things actually exist in labs like ours right now. We don't yet have ways to make them yet so that you can go buy a bucket of them at the hardware store and put it on your roof, but we could do that if we really set our minds to it. We could really find ways to store energy from the sun so as to avoid this issue of intermittency. We could really find ways to deploy much more rapidly and more smartly nuclear power if we decided to go there. We could do all sorts of things with technology. Technology ultimately got us into this mess and really it's going to be policy, economics, and a big piece of technology if we're going to get our way out of it sooner rather than later. What we really have to understand the level of investment that is needed to make a big difference in this enormous business that is the energy business. Right now, if you look at a percentage of revenue going into research and development, R&D, the electric utility industry spends less as a percentage of revenue on R&D than does the dog food industry. So if you are putting your money where your mouth is, we are literally going to the dogs when it comes to spending on energy innovation. We have a one and a half trillion dollar or so energy industry just in the United States. Most companies will say they have to spend at high tech companies 10% of revenue on R&D to run fast or die, to invent the next generation of computer chips, to invent the next generation of iPods into iPads or whatever your favorite gizmo is, or to invent the next generation of pharmaceuticals to make antibiotics before the bugs figure it out first and become resistant. If we spent 10% of revenue on R&D and energy, we'd be spending $150 billion every year trying to innovate our way out of the problem before it gets to us. Now maybe private industry should bear the burden of two-thirds of that. That leaves about a third, maybe a fifth. But either way you look at the arithmetic, it's something like 20 or 30 billion dollars a year we should be putting right here, right now, into clean energy innovation ideas so that we can get all these smart scientists and engineers and technical people in all the garages and in the Silicon Valleys inventing and failing as well as succeeding and picking the ones that win to, so that we can deploy what we have now as well as develop these faster, better, cheaper ways to help us get through this issue in the one time chance that we have to get it done. I think that there's more of a perception problem in this particular instance than a real systemic problem. First of all, in energy technology as opposed to in studying fundamental observations like the issue of did the climate researchers uh, not release all the data that they might have otherwise wanted to release into the public or should have released, that doesn't really affect whether or not the earth is getting warmer or not. Of course it is getting warmer and of course glaciers are melting. You can't hide the fact that glaciers are all melting all over our planet regardless of whether or not you did or didn't release one data point here or there. It doesn't change anything that anybody with two eyes open can't see. At the same time in energy technology you can't hide it if it works or not because either this device saves energy and people buy it and find it out or it doesn't. Either your car gets more miles per gallon on the showroom than the next one or it doesn't. Either the solar farm makes electricity or it doesn't. It's pretty hard to say that you're eliminating or slowing down the rate of progress in this area 
because you're concealing the fact that you can really do a lot of good things with clean, cheap energy that you didn't tell anybody about. So I don't think it's really an issue in that part of this problem. There are two differences, at least, that I see between the asteroid problem as you've posed it and the climate change problem. First is the fact that you can't see carbon dioxide. It's a colorless, non-toxic to humans at some concentration gas. On the other hand, how would you feel if everybody on the freeway, every mile they drove, stopped, opened their windows, and dumped out a pound of trash? That's exactly what we do. It's just you can't see that pound of carbon dioxide trash that comes out of everybody's tailpipe on average every single mile we drive. The second thing is that if the asteroid were absolutely hitting the Earth, we would probably really respond. But there's some probability that it may get by and then we always have to understand the cost benefit analysis of do we act or not. The same thing is true with carbon dioxide emissions. We don't absolutely know what levels of carbon dioxide are or are not, quote, safe. And so we get into an actually, in my opinion, very inappropriate discussion of whether or not we should take action or not. The real issue is not whether we can prove that climate change will or will not occur within 10 or 20 or 30 years. The real issue is that we don't really know for sure, but we only get to do this experiment once. And if we get into a situation that we don't like, we can't do anything about changing it back to where it was. This is not a situation of sound science. It is all about rolling the dice once with the one planet that we have.